Throughout the years, scientists have made some discoveries that seem to hint at the existence of extraterrestrial life. But do they really? Let's find out. In 1976, NASA's Viking Mars landers detected chemical signatures that could be a sign of extraterrestrial life. During one of the experiments, Martian soil was mixed with special nutrients and then tested for the production of methane gas. And the test's result was positive. In other words, something in the soil was metabolizing these nutrients and producing the gas. Unfortunately, other experiments conducted on board the landers didn't show any evidence of life. It caused NASA to declare the result a false positive. And still, some scientists keep standing by the finding, arguing that the experiments on board were ill-equipped to look for a key indicator of life, organic molecules. In 1977, an Ohio State University radio telescope detected a bizarre pulse of radiation coming from someplace near the Sagittarius constellation. It lasted 37 seconds and was so unexpected that the astronomer who was monitoring the data at that moment scribbled, wow, on the telescope's printout. The thing is that the radio frequency of the signal is internationally banned on Earth. The signal could be the result of a supermassive astronomical event, or it could be sent by some kind of intelligent life with immensely powerful transmitters. So far, this mystery has remained unexplained. In 1996, NASA scientists announced that they had found something that could be microbes in a potato-shaped chunk of Martian rock. The meteorite might have been blasted off the surface of Mars in a collision. It had been wandering the solar system for about 15 million years before it fell in Antarctica. Analyses showed that the meteorite contained some organic molecules and tiny particles of the mineral called magnetite. It's sometimes found in bacteria living on our planet. NASA researchers used an electron microscope and announced that they had spotted nanobacteria. But since that time, this evidence has been called into question a few times. Some experts say that the particles of magnitude are not really similar to those found on our planet. And Earth's contaminants are likely to be the source of organic molecules. Jupiter's moon Europa has a bizarre red tinge. Some of the theories explaining this phenomenon have suggested the reason is frozen bits of bacteria, which are also responsible for the mysterious infrared signal the moon gives off. But this theory hasn't been proven yet. The existence of life in Venus's clouds might explain curious anomalies in the composition of the planet's atmosphere. Solar radiation and lightning are supposed to generate tons of carbon monoxide on Venus. But in reality, this gas is rare as if something is removing it. Another weird thing is the presence of both hydrogen sulfide and sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere. Usually, these two readily react together. That's why it's rare to find them coexisting. The only explanation can be that some process keeps churning them out. But probably the most mysterious is the presence of carbonyl sulfide. The thing is, on Earth, it's only produced by microbes and not by some inorganic process. Some experts believe that microbes might be living in the atmosphere of Venus. The surface of the planet, scorching hot and acidic, isn't very suitable for the development of life. But up in the atmosphere, it's moist and hospitable, with a pressure similar to Earth and pleasant temperatures. But again, we haven't received any solid proof yet. In 2003, scientists discussed the possibility that the traces of sulfur on Jupiter's moon Europa could be the waste products of colonies of underground bacteria. The compounds were first discovered by the Galileo space probe, which also found some evidence of a volcanically warmed ocean beneath the icy crust of the moon. The sulfur signatures look similar to the waste products of bacteria living in the surface ice covering lakes in Antarctica on Earth. But other scientists rejected the idea. They argued that the sulfur could have come from the neighboring moon. I.O. there, it's found in abundance. It's September 1977. You're playing one of the first video game consoles released in North America. You step outside and see the whole neighborhood waiting for Voyager 1 to launch. It's a super sunny day, so you squint a little, trying to see what's happening. You live in the neighborhood right outside the launching station. You get yourself some food and watch the Voyager take off into space. 
You're so impressed, you decide to dedicate your career to working with NASA. 35 years later, you're now a senior official in NASA, specializing in Voyager 1. It's 2012, and you're sitting in the control room with your colleagues. Everyone is staring at their computer screens as they work on the Voyager. You're sitting on the top, overlooking everything and making sure all systems are in check. This day is special, as Voyager 1 is about to exit the heliosphere, which is a science word for the outer shell of our solar system. It's a bubble of space affected by the solar wind, which comes from the sun. By 2021, it got 14 billion miles away from Earth, which is equivalent to 153 astronomical units from the sun. One astronomical unit is the distance between the sun and the Earth. The craft was originally meant to fly by Uranus, Saturn, and Jupiter, and toss itself from one planet to another with the use of their gravitational pull. Everyone is impatiently waiting for it to exit the heliosphere. Three, two, one, and it's officially out. All systems are normal and functioning. You praise your team for doing an excellent job. With Voyager 1 reaching this far, there's still tons to explore in outer space. You were once a young adult, watching the craft launch outside your neighborhood. And now, you're the main person in charge of the operation. Nine years later. Since Voyager 1 left the heliosphere, you've been checking up on it every now and then, making sure all systems and functions are in order. It's been sending back measurements of the interstellar medium. It's the area between the stars of our galaxy, consisting of ionized materials. Ionized is basically a simple version of a molecule or substance. The interstellar medium is an electrically charged state of plasma, or ionized plasma, and is very unstable. It's like going from lightning in a thunderstorm back to calm rain in a matter of seconds. The plasma up there is different than the plasma on Earth, in that it's difficult to filter out. There are around 0.06 atoms for every cubic inch in the interstellar medium. The air we breathe on Earth has billions of atoms. By measuring the plasma in the interstellar medium, we can further understand the behavior and structure of chemicals and gases. It's possible that the oxygen we know and love on Earth is different than the ones out there. One of your main tasks is to learn more about how the solar wind from the sun and interstellar medium interact with each other to create the heliosphere. So, after doing some routine checkups and other maintenance work on Voyager 1 from the control room, you notice something strange coming from the screen. You sit in front of the computer, crunching the numbers of the plasma vibrations and convert them into an audio file of about 3 kilohertz. You click on it and listen to an eerie, subtle hum. You and your team are surprised that these vibrations occurred in such a small frequency. Given that space is massive, something like this might mean life on other planets. Everyone else at the station rushes to the control room to listen to that sound from outer space. It's monotonous and faint, but it's definitely coming from outside the heliosphere. You run the numbers over and over to make sure it's not a fluke, but it's on point. You make sure your team doesn't spill the beans to anyone outside until everything is known and clear. You get into beast mode with work and try to catch the sound again, and it remains. You can't sleep trying to think of something that could be producing this hum. A few days pass by, and the sound is pretty consistent. If there was some life out there trying to communicate with you, then surely it would have said something that can be deciphered. You analyze the audio files once again, trying to see if it's some phonetic language you don't know. You call in a linguist to see if she can make something out of it. You and the squad gather around, waiting impatiently for some answers. After a while, she believes that it might be someone out there communicating with us, but the only way to find out is by sending something back to them. You arrange a meeting with your team and try to figure out what message you can send. After much thinking and lots of coffee, you decide to send them one phrase in English. Who are you? You send out the signal through Voyager 1 and wait for any changes in the hum, but you don't get anything straight away. It may take some time for a response. You wait all night and still there's nothing. 
it's starting to look like there isn't anything out there. For the next couple of days, you keep sending out phrases for anything to pick up. Since space is a vacuum, sound waves can't travel. So sending out voice messages on a large speaker won't work. You locate the source of the humming and aim for it when sending the audio file. Every day, you send something different, but still, you don't hear anything from them for a week. It seems that intelligent life in the distant world isn't real. The areas between the star systems and a galaxy aren't necessarily a complete vacuum. That's where the interstellar medium is. It contains gases, dust, and cosmic rays, which are energy particles. After many months of this constant humming being produced, you still try to figure out what's going on. You sit there, remembering the time when the Voyager was first launched. You remember running outside after playing some video games. You couldn't see properly because of the sun, and you freeze in your spot and have a eureka moment. You go through some notes taken in the past. The answer was in front of you all this time. Every now and then, the sun sends a burst of energy that causes the plasma of interstellar space to vibrate. Scientists can measure the frequency of waves when the plasma vibrates to show how close they are to each other. And on the day when the hum was delivered, there were some irregular frequencies coming from the sun. So that hum might have been the plasma vibrating in a weird way because of the sun flares. But these low-level vibrations last longer than quick jumps and spikes. They're fainter. You run the tests again and find out that it's not some intelligent life forms out there trying to talk to you. It's the little vibrations caused by sun flares. You notify your team about this breakthrough and everyone's celebrating. But after all these tests and research, you still don't know why plasma hmm. in the interstellar medium vibrates in such a way. Those answers will have to wait. 2027. It's been 50 years since the launch of Voyager 1. You're way into your senior years and just retired from NASA. You have many scholarships in your name and programs for young people who want to learn about space and science. You go back to the control room once more, where you thought you had discovered intelligent life on a distant world. Then you remember all the good times you had. You say goodbye to everything, knowing that this is Voyager's final moments. It was built to last up to 50 years. After that, it'll just be a floating object in the vastness of space. It's already surprising to know that this is Earth's most distant object from us. But it's time to let others take your place. You shut off the lights and close the door. The Voyager makes one last beep before eternal silence. The universe is expanding. And if it's expanding, then it probably had a beginning somewhere. Now all we have to do is to run time backward and see where the beginning was. It took the scientists many more years to come up with a full-fledged theory. The Big Bang Theory. And here it is. Nothing has ever been anywhere, because neither when nor where existed. But actually, no. There was one thing. It was the so-called cosmic singularity. A state of our universe in which it was incredibly small, dense, and very, very hot. Imagine if our universe was compressed into a small ball. The pressure and temperature inside would be enormous. At some point it became impossible to withstand them. And here comes the Big Bang. It was an outburst of energy and matter that created everything we see now. Time and space, basic physical forces. It also scattered quarks everywhere. These quarks, tiny particles that make up our world, were all boiling in an incredibly hot cosmic broth. When it cooled down, gravity began to attract them to each other. They gathered into atoms, then molecules, and then into the first objects in the world. Stars. But what was before that? Alan Harvey Guth, an American theoretical physicist and cosmologist, has devoted his whole life to solving this mystery. After learning about the Big Bang Theory, Guth found some flaws in it. For example, the distribution of matter was very even, although it shouldn't have been. If we drop the balloon filled with paint down, it will burst, and we'll see absolute chaos on the canvas. But the early universe don't look like. The early universe was very even and proportional. That was Guth's discovery. 
the theory of inflation. Here's what it says. Even before the Big Bang, there was some kind of force that could give the bang a strong acceleration, something that was able to distribute everything in space instantly and evenly. Martin Boyovald is a German professor of physics, and in his opinion, the universe was born quite differently. According to Martin's theory, the singularity couldn't just appear out of nowhere. Let's look at a pendulum on the old clock. The pendulum rotates back and forth. Its movement is smooth, continuous, and non-stop. This is how we usually see time. It flows and never stops. But quantum time doesn't work that way. It consists of small segments and makes short pauses. And just like with the second hand of a clock, the beginning of one segment of time is always the end of another. According to the Big Bang Theory, once upon a time, our universe began to expand, inflate like a balloon. But sooner or later, it will blow away back. The universe will start shrinking and return to the state of cosmic singularity. And then, the Big Bang too. Nothing appears out of nowhere and disappears into nowhere. According to Boyovald's theory, the beginning of each universe is the end of the previous one. Our universe is not at all the first and not the last. Millions of similar universes existed before us and will exist after us. This theory, although it sounds very logical, is far from complete. So for now, all this is just a hypothesis. But some people come up with even stranger ideas. Neil Turok, a South African physicist, and his colleague Paul Steinhardt, an American theoretical physicist. They say that yes, our universe isn't the first one. Our universe is just one of an infinite number of others. And all of us are stuck in a cycle of endless rebirths of parallel worlds. According to this theory, our universe is located inside a so-called brain, as in membrane. In other words, we're stuck in some kind of elastic surface that's capable of contracting, stretching, oscillating, and so on. Like pieces of fabric on a rope. Another universe may be an inch from ours, but we can't see it. That's because there's a tiny space between us, and this tiny space contains the fourth dimension. How do these universes originate? Through brain collision. These brains are getting closer to each other very, very slowly, until they finally collide. Their collision creates two big bangs and two parallel universes. Then they're moving away from each other. The created worlds continue to live. We're currently at this stage. Remember the inflation theory? There was a mysterious energy that pushed and accelerated the Big Bang. Well, if we did collide with another universe, that would explain everything. Which idea is closer to you? How about the idea of subscribing? Subscribe. AI can drive a car, design trendy clothes, give you emotional support, and it looks like it can also help us find answers to centuries-long mysteries. Researchers from Yamagata University Institute of Nazca and IBM Japan used a deep learning AI model to find new Nazca lines. Those are distinct white lines on the rusty red background that you can see from a plane while flying over the deserts of southern Peru. Scientists have tried to decipher the meaning of the Nazca lines ever since they were first discovered in the 1920s. There are straight lines, rectangles, triangles, and swirls. There are also some giant drawings. You can see a monkey, a whale, a condor, a hummingbird. The four recently discovered geoglyphs, which is the scientific word for those drawings, show a humanoid-like figure holding a club, a fish, a bird, and a pair of legs. What is the hidden symbolism of all that? And why did the Nazca people decide to draw a humanoid in the desert? And did they even know who humanoids were? Let's dig into history to find some answers. The representatives of the ancient Nazca culture created their famous lines more than 2,000 years ago. The geoglyphs have stood the test of time thanks to a dry climate and strong winds in the desert. Scientists found that to form the lines, the Nazca people scraped off the top layer of pebbles, revealing the contrasting soil beneath. The soil's color varies from reddish-brown to yellowish-gray. It makes it look like the lines are constantly changing appearance. 
It looks like the creators first made small-scale models and then enlarged them to create the full-scale designs we see today. In total, there are more than 800 straight lines, around 300 geometric figures, and 70 animals and plant designs. You can find the first mention of the lines in the 16th century chronicle of Peru, where they were first described as trail markers in the desert. Since you can't really study the lines and their symbolism from the ground, those geoglyphs only became world famous only in the 1930s. It was the start of the era of commercial planes, so more and more people could witness the lines from their window seats and spread the word. During his research a decade later, Professor Paul Cossack noticed that one of the lines aligned with the setting sun on the day after the winter solstice, which is the shortest day of the year. He supposed that the lines had some astronomical significance. German researcher Maria Reihe, who got the nickname the Lady of the Lines, supported the theory that the geoglyphs served as a calendar and some sort of astronomical purposes. She spent 40 years studying the lines and literally swept them inch by inch. She also moved into a small house close to the lines to protect them from unwanted visitors. And that's how the Nazca Lines mystery was solved. Just kidding. In the 1970s, American researchers began to question astronomical theory. In a region like Nazca, one of the driest places on Earth with only around 20 minutes of rain per year, water is a real treasure. So the straight lines and trapezoids could have something to do with it. They could have been an ancient version of Google Maps, pointing at locations for rituals that the local people organized to get some water and help their crops grow. The images of animals in the Andes region are also related to water. Spiders are thought to be a sign of rain. Hummingbirds symbolize fertility. And monkeys living in the Amazon mean an abundance of water. That could explain the choice of symbols in the desert, but there's no strong proof to support this theory. So the work on explaining the meaning of those mysterious geoglyphs is going on. In the 21st century, the Nazca Lines have become the research ground for archaeologists from Yamagata University. Masato Sakai, a professor of archaeology, together with others on the team, are using high-resolution aerial photography and drones to discover and catalog the lines. They found images of humans, camelids, birds, orca whales, cats, and snakes, most likely created between 100 before current era and 300 current era. Some of the images are around 10 to 20 feet long, and that's why they were pretty tricky to notice. The largest geoglyphs are 1,200 feet across, which is about the height of the Empire State Building. The researchers believe the Nazca lines were a form of communication in the desert for their creators. The linear ones pointed the direction from valley to valley. The ones drawn on slopes seem to have been drawn along ancient pathways between settlements. Professor Sakai explains that discovering new lines is tricky. Some of them are so poorly preserved that it's hard to spot them in aerial photos. There are also irrigation systems and roads all across the Nazca region, and it complicates the task. And that's where AI comes in handy. The team showed it pictures of previously explored Nazca lines so it could learn what to look for. Then, AI went through tons of footage taken from planes and satellites and also laser data from previous surveys to identify the lines scientists hadn't found before. The system works 21 times faster than humans, and it made some curious discoveries. Scientists then traveled to the locations it chose to verify the findings. In 2019, AI helped to discover a humanoid-shaped character with a rectangular head who is holding a stick and wearing a headdress. It became a real puzzle for the scientists trying to understand the creature's role in ancient society. The little guy is neighbors with another famous geoglyph. It's a hermit, which is a subgroup of hummingbirds that lives in the forested regions of northern and eastern Peru. The largest of the recently found geoglyphs is a pair of legs. It's more than 250 feet across, about four-fifths as tall as Big Ben. Could be an homage to some ancient supermodel. The fish and the bird are around four times smaller. Why they are where they are is still a mystery. 
listing new geoglyphs isn't the only way AI is helping scientists. It's doing a lot of good for astronomy. It analyzes vast amounts of astronomical data and uses its algorithms to identify patterns, classify celestial objects, and even predict new events. For example, AI models have been developed to detect and categorize galaxies, search for exoplanets, and identify rare cosmic phenomena. It also helped analyze data obtained by the Kepler mission to discover new Earth-sized planets circling other stars. AI is also transforming the field of chemistry. Machine learning algorithms can predict chemical reactions, discover new compounds, and optimize chemical processes. All of this helps scientists save a lot of time and resources in the labs. If you've ever written a thesis, you know that analyzing vast chunks of information can take forever. Now imagine you need to analyze the archives of the British Library's national newspaper. It's piles and piles of history. So researchers are teaming up with the curators to develop special software that can analyze the vast amounts of data extracted from these collections. Computational linguists and historians will be able to delve deep into the past and get some insights into changes in society and culture. They'll focus on key periods and track how advancements in technology shaped various aspects of society. AI even helps in the conservation of seals. It's really expensive and challenging to monitor certain species of those cutie pies living in the sea ice zone. Using high-resolution satellites, researchers can now identify the seals in photos, which already helps. But manually counting seals across huge areas of ice is like putting together a jigsaw puzzle of a blue sky consisting of a million pieces. It takes a lot of patience, and different analysts come up with different results. Machine learning algorithms can be trained to recognize and distinguish seals in satellite imagery and count them automatically. Researchers can then use this accurate data to monitor seal populations over time and study their behavior and habitat more In the icy wilderness of Antarctica, there was a peculiar rock. Amidst the vast, smooth, and snowy landscape, it stood alone like a dark smudge. This rock had been there for ages, untouched except for occasional snowfall. Roberta Score, a lab manager at NASA's Johnson Space Center, had spent countless hours in Antarctica, searching for rocks just like this one. Antarctica was an unexpected treasure trove for these discoveries. These rocks were easy to spot against the blindingly white ice. Why was it so important? Because it wasn't just any rock. It was a meteorite that had fallen from space thousands of years ago. Roberta's rock known as ALH 84001, was initially unimpressive. However, it turned out to be extraordinary. It was a piece of Mars. The rock's chemical composition perfectly matched the surface of the red planet. Turns out, it had been blasted off Mars during a colossal collision millions of years ago. It was wandering through space before landing on Earth. There, it had remained undisturbed for a very long time. Scientists at Johnson Space Center carefully examined this Martian visitor. Years later, physicists made a remarkable announcement. This meteorite contained tiny structures that looked just like living organisms found on Earth. NASA immediately shared this discovery with the world. We found fossilized evidence of life on Mars. However, as other scientists got their hands on the rock and conducted further studies, they began to doubt it. Yes, it was a fascinating piece of rock, but Martian chemistry might create similar structures without life being involved. So, unfortunately, it wasn't conclusive evidence. But all this debate raised a very important question. Would we recognize extraterrestrial life if we saw it? There are more than 200 different definitions of life in scientific literature. So, what should we be looking for? To figure out what makes something alive, scientists have come up with three important things that living things must have. First, living things need to store information about themselves. This information tells them how to work and what they're like. It's a bit like having a set of instructions for how they function. Second, they need to be able to interact with their environment and create reactions. 
These reactions help them get energy, move around, and respond to changes or dangers. Lastly, they must be able to make copies of themselves, reproducing, and making other things that are just like them. This ability is a big part of what makes something alive. The famous physicist Erwin Schrödinger was one of the first people to figure this out. He said that storing, using, and passing on information is super important for life. It's like a cycle. Information helps create reactions, and some of those reactions let living things make copies of themselves. On Earth, we see this in action. We humans, for example, have DNA to store our information. It helps us with our evolution. Thanks to all this, we can adapt to our surroundings over time. Nature sees that some traits are helpful for survival, so they stick around, while others get left behind. In other words, a way to define life is by saying that it's subject to this process called Darwinian evolution. But how did it happen that things capable of evolution appeared? And when did the very first life emerge in our universe? To find out the answer, let's go to the very beginning of everything. The beginning was the Big Bang. Right after it, there were no stars or galaxies. The universe started as a mostly even and empty place, with just a tiny bit denser than the rest. After the first second or so, first protons, neutrons, and electrons, among other particles, appeared. And just about a couple of minutes later, these protons and neutrons came together to make stable atomic cores. Then, everything was a super-hot soup of particles for about 380,000 years. It was way too hot to form anything dense. The universe needed some time to chill. After it calmed down a bit, it let electrons join these cores, forming neutral atoms for the first time. Ah, finally, some comfy temperatures! If we were there, we wouldn't have needed the sun to keep us warm. That cosmic background radiation would have been enough. Could life appear at this point? Mm, probably not. In those early moments after the Big Bang, the universe had only hydrogen, helium, a tiny bit of lithium, and almost none of the other elements life needs. Life as we know requires things like water and organic compounds. So it wasn't about the temperatures, it was about the ingredients. Now everything had to form over time from these atoms. To create something like a planet, which is much denser than the universe on average, it needed a lot of time and gravitational squeezing. Gravity is the real hero of this story. It changed the universe completely. Even though it started slow, it kept going and got stronger. Regions that were a bit denser could pull in more matter, and the denser they got, the more they attracted. The very first star should have formed around 50 to 100 million years after the Big Bang. These stars could become incredibly massive, hundreds or even a thousand times bigger than our Sun. And when these stars formed, it didn't take long, maybe one or two million years, before they disappeared. Just for comparison, our own Sun is 4.6 billion years old and still going strong. When huge stars reach the end of their lives, something incredible happens. They transform helium into carbon, then carbon into oxygen, and oxygen into a bunch of other stuff all the way up the periodic table. Then the star's core collapses, causing a massive supernova. This huge BAM releases all these heavy elements into the universe. Hooray! Now the space is filled with something new. The universe acquires many cool things, including the ingredients needed for rocky planets and organic molecules. Each generation of stars gets even richer than the previous one. Yes to more elements. It means more rocky planets, more essential ingredients for life, and more chances for complex organic molecules to form. And now, when the universe was around 300 to 500 million years old, rocky planets were already popping up everywhere. Great. Can we have some life now? Mm. That depends on what we see as life. The recipe for life as we know it needs a special ingredient, carbon. Carbon is special because it can bond with other atoms in so many ways. It can connect with different shapes to build all sorts of amazing complex structures. It's carbon that helps us form things like DNA and proteins, 
which are the building blocks of living things. Now, while the universe made rocky planets relatively quickly, it took a bit longer to get enough carbon floating around. It appeared about 1 to 1.5 billion years after the Big Bang. As soon as it appeared, the universe finally had enough conditions to create life as we know it. Which is why scientists are searching for planets around these oldest stars in the universe. These guys definitely had enough time for evolution. But just because you and me are made of carbon and other elements from exploded stars, doesn't mean that all life should be. Scientists are open to the idea of alternative biochemistries. There might be non-carbon-based life that we don't know about yet. For example, blobby beings made of silicon compounds. It's carbon's neighbor in the periodic table. So when and where did life truly begin? Unfortunately, we don't know for sure yet. Most likely, the universe started preparing for life shortly after the first stars formed. And if all life is carbon-based only, then it should have appeared 1 to 1.5 billion years after the Big Bang. The universe is 13.8 billion years old. Looks like it had plenty of time to evolve lots of microorganisms. So even if we made a mistake, and the mysterious meteorite was just a piece of rock, we shouldn't give up. The search for extraterrestrial life continues, and who knows? Maybe in the future, we'll finally know the answers to all these important questions. Until then, stay tuned. If you could track the line of evolution and go back an exceptionally long time ago, you'd see some weird creatures called Ediacarans. It seems like these little fellas made of tubes showed up 579 million years ago. They thrived at the bottom of the ocean for about 37 million years, chilling and minding their own business. It continued until they disappeared, or better yet, turned into faint marks we now only know from the sandstone fossil record. The world started to change for these ancient creatures somewhere around 541 million years ago, when a lot of new life forms came into being. Some new creatures began to evolve, and it's possible they might have replaced our friends. They might have changed the environment in ways that made it hard for these poor fellas to survive. Why does this even matter that much? It was the first time when a complex life form went extinct because of other living things. Usually, when you hear about lots of creatures vanishing from the face of the Earth, it's due to something like a giant volcanic eruption poisoning the oceans, or a big space rock slamming into our planet. For example, 440 million years ago, a big change in the planet's climate happened. The water in the oceans became colder, and it wiped away a lot of ocean life. The southern part of a big landmass called Gondwana ended up covered with ice quickly. This made a lot of Earth's water turn into ice, which, again, caused the sea levels to drop. Creatures from that time were struggling to find food. Plus, they didn't have homes where they could evolve, live, and reproduce. Then there was this interesting period called the Age of Fishes, when a wide variety of different sea creatures appeared on Earth. Even though some animals were starting to live on land, most of the action and fun was still in the oceans. At least until the moment when trees and plants ruined the party. Their roots started growing on dry land and it transformed the world, turning rubble and rock into soil. This was fun for land animals, but it gave all those fellas in the ocean depths a lot to worry about. The soil, rich in nutrients, got into the oceans, which made a lot of algae grow in the water. These blooms eventually caused enormous dead zones, where algae took away oxygen from the water. So lots of marine animals that were simply fine living their peaceful lives in the ocean couldn't breathe there anymore. Plus, they didn't have enough food to survive. Or we can talk about the biggest extinction event called the Great Dying, 253 million years ago, when almost 90% of all species on Earth vanished, including many land creatures such as insects, reptiles, and amphibians. This happened because of insanely strong volcanic eruptions. When you see what happened in the past during these extinction events, you can understand better why the case of Edicarians is so intriguing. 
researchers haven't found any evidence that low oxygen levels or some other troubles that might have happened in their environment could have caused them to disappear. Also, they've agreed that conditions weren't that bad since the creature's fossils remain intact. They look for answers in southern Namibia, studying rocks that contain fossils from the time when ancient creatures vanished and new ones came to the scene. Researchers found many traces of these new ones left behind. Modern animals are like architects of their environment. They change things around them, dig into the ground, and eat one another. But if they caused ancient creatures to disappear, the remains of those species had to show some signs of struggling, something the fossils from Namibia indicated. Traces were similar to predatory sea sea anemones. Well, you know what I'm trying to say. How did tiny, simple cells even turn into such complex organisms anyway? Throughout time, they got bigger and ended up with nuclei and mitochondria, parts that help cells work. But it's still not completely clear what really happened here. The most accepted theory is that mitochondria, which are like the powerhouse of the cell, came from a kind of bacteria that got inside another bigger cell. This bigger cell started to change over time developing more parts, like the nucleus. This way, a cell became stronger and more complex. That sounds cool, but we can't be sure of this. One of the problems with this idea is that we don't see cells in between the simple and complex stages. There's also a new theory that says that the first step toward complex forms of life involved a bacterial cell that formed bumps on its surface. These bumps trap similar bacteria, which then helped the cell get bigger. As it grew, the bumps turned into parts, and some of these parts later turned out to be useful, such as endoplasmic reticulum, the outer nucleus membrane. More and more parts started developing, which meant increasingly complex forms of life. And the most complex known creature that we ended up with is this tiny transparent water flake. It has 31,000 genes, which is 25% more than what humans have. This water flea is especially interesting because it can transform its shape when things get tough. It can grow spines, helmets, or even teeth, depending on its surroundings. And this might be because it has so many genes. Scientists copied its genes, and instead of staying the same, they quickly changed their roles to adjust to the environment. Researchers believe the copied genes would stay the same and only change later. So this was a bit of a surprise. And this interesting creature even has some genes like ours. This may help us understand our own kind better. For instance, how humans react to different threats in the environment, and how we can improve things that negatively affect our health. Or imagine if we could grow some of those cool additional organs, like this water flea. The first complex forms of life are older than we thought. 1.6 billion years ago, there was a happy community of small, bright red things that looked like plants. It was flitting around in a shallow pool of ancient waters and eventually ended up trapped in rocks and preserved till the end of time. A few years ago, scientists from Sweden found these fossils in India and concluded that they could be red algae. Using a special method, they carefully extracted them from the rock and discovered two types of red algae, one that looked like a segmented noodle and the other with layers of cells. To understand them better, the researchers made 3D models of them and used radioactive dating to confirm their age. If that's true, they're almost half a billion years older than we previously thought. A very long time ago, our home planet was hot because of all those things slamming into its surface, like asteroids and comets. This made it difficult for life to start there. But about 3.8 billion years ago, these hits slowed down, and life finally appeared on Earth. At first, those were simple life forms. But then, more of these space objects hit Earth. And it's possible some of them brought water and other stuff important for life. Some life forms survived these hits and finally had a chance to evolve. However, we still don't have unambiguous evidence of how it all started, so no one is sure if life on Earth appeared just once or multiple times in unusual ways. 
our planet had building blocks, which are elements important for the appearance of life, even a long time ago. These blocks could have appeared naturally or might have come from space rocks. As they join together, they form more complex things, like proteins, fats, and DNA. And maybe this process happened more than once. Someday, we'll find the answers because it will help us understand not only our planet, but the odds of life emerging on other planets too.